Thank you for joining me. We have this wonderful instrument, the piano, and of course, the center of it. I remember my little sister, age seven, playing her first recital, one piece, in a competition festival in Edinburgh. And as she and my mother took their seats, she wouldn't sit down. She said, Mummy, I want to go and look at the piano. So off she went and just walked around the piano. My mother said, why did you do that, dear? And she said, I wanted to check. There was a middle C. And then she was happy. <laughs> and that can be helpful for other people. Um, I had a lovely friend who was a very distinguished poet. And she had her lo a grand piano like this in her house in Devon on Dartmoor. And when things became perhaps too much for her at any point, she just went to the piano and played Little C. She was a pianist, that's all she did. And then she felt centered. Of course, when as a child we looked at the whole keyboard and saw the black notes. They were rather special. I remember my grandfather, he was a minister in the Church of Scotland and he, I can see his hands on the keys, his cufflinks and his signet ring. And he was very clever and played this piece. I can't play it, here we go again. thought it was rather difficult one. I think it's a good piece for youngsters to learn. So I thought it was called Chopsticks, but I heard the other day that it was perhaps um, the Dewdrop Waltz or something like that. You probably know better than I do. So there's the black keys and the white keys. All this idea of talking at the piano came to me when I arrived at a concert arranged for a group of people who were on a National Trust Houses and Gardens course. And one of the evenings was to be a dinner at Castle Drogo, followed by a concert, which I was to play Carnival Schumann. And I arrived with the group of people in the coach. We just scraped a little stone bridge in, on Dartmoor. I remember that was the hold up. We arrived at the castle and I went to the piano and they went downstairs to the supper room. And I just put my hands on the keys and played and gasped because in the midst of all the arrangements, no one had remembered actually to get this piano tuned. And I thought, this is going to be awful for the listeners. So I better play as little as possible and talk as much as possible. And that was the beginning of a really useful approach to recitals. So here, just remind me of that occasion, is the lovely Chiarina part of Carnival. Not too long, that's the point. So I looked at the keyboard and I thought, well, what is there of interest here? Well, the top end of the keyboard, which of course has expanded since Haydn, say. Haydn had this sort of length, five octaves. So even Beethoven stretched the music just to get the top, and just over the tension of not getting beyond in his early days, not getting beyond that top note. Now the top note on this piano, which was made in 1899, is an A. And so today's pianos are even longer at, the, at both ends. 
Um, I was playing a Prokofiev Toccata, which, when I was practicing, doesn't quite fit on. If you see this part, um, I'm doing octaves. And the top of my hand has to go over onto the, onto the wooden bit because I haven't enough notes. It's a great piece. So, I had to watch that. But what also I had to watch was, I remember playing in a school concert to secondary school pupils in, in Hoik, in the Borders, and I went, I was drum, being a bit dramatic, and I went from top end down to there and missed and hit quite hard this wooden end of the keyboard. There was an upright piano, I remember, and it was jolly sore for a day or two, so I learned a lesson. But one more story on the top end. I remember playing uh, the Cesar Frank sonata, wonderful sonata, violin sonata, but could be played on the cello with a Canadian violinist, and the, rehearsal, the recital went very, very well, lunchtime concert in the Great Hall in Exeter. Um, and at the very end, there's a great end, the trill uh, on the violin, and underneath. And the top note is an A, of course, and I just wasn't, I was just got too tense at that point. I, which was stupid, and um, I actually hit the, a G sharp, I think it was. I mean, I managed to get an A at the bottom, but I remember going off, furious with myself, and we came back, we were asked to do an encore, and thank goodness the violins had chosen a Spanish piece with an A all over the place, and I remember playing this A really firmly to get it back into the, into the oral world of this whole great hall. So we have to watch what we're doing at both ends of the keys. Then I looked at the piano in this uh, evening in, on Dartmoor, and I thought, right, what can I say next? And I saw the lid. Well, I remember when I was teaching at Dartington, a student <laughs> saying to me, oh, she was horrified as a child aged about two or three. She had been playing, her father had been playing on the keyboard. And um, she is a child, Fair enough, I got hold of this and it dropped down. She, without realising it, pulled down and it actually broke her father's fingers. So I can still remember, this is a piano I've had for years, it was first on loan from a musical scholarship trust, wonderful one. Um, and I sellotaped from there to there for my two children, so it made sure that they couldn't possibly pull it down on my fingers. Uh, and it, I had to watch that the marks got removed of the sellotape. So that's what can, there's this all sorts of unknown risks if you have children um, playing with you. Uh, in fact, my grandson, bless them, they had great fun one day uh, colouring the whole of the keyboard with felt tip pens while I was doing some ironing, can you imagine? Uh, then, of course, we have this great big lid of the keyboard, the great lid of the, of the piano, rather. Um, and I had a, a friend in, who was a concert pianist uh, she was playing very, very powerfully. Uh, do you remember the Beethoven C minor piano concerto? And when she came in after the whole orchestral introduction, she did a great big... Like that. Very powerful. She'd been very well taught as well. A very dramatic person. And the lid of the piano slammed shut. It hadn't been put up properly. It slammed shut with the sound of a gunshot. <laughs> Everybody got such a shock in St Andrew's Hall in Glasgow that the performance came to a complete halt. <laughs> so they had to start again. So the lesson is always to make sure your lid is clearly put up with the stick right in the middle of that hole. In fact, one more story on the lid. I remember a vast piano, even bigger than the uh, concert grand, so it looked like something out of a castle. And this lid was fully up and we had to try and put it back down again after the concert. And the awful thing was those hinges had got a bit ancient that held it to the end of the piano. And suddenly this great lid, two of us holding it, shifted, fell, and just missed a painting, a rather valuable painting. So, 
never a dull minute for a pianist. Let's move on now. Let's look at the pedals. Now, pedals very useful. I used to think how beautiful the shape was. Uh, the right hand pedal to sustain the sounds you're making. The left pedal to move the the hammers up so that you're only striking one string so it becomes like a mute instead of that choir per sound. I was playing on a baby grand in a house in Hampstead. I was practicing for a concert. It was the Beethoven Tempest Sonata, so rather dramatic. Um, and I was pedaling quite oh, firmly to go with the music and suddenly I felt a funny feeling down there and I was able to pick up the pedal in my hand to my horror. I'd cracked through the metal connection and I was very embarrassed and went to my hostess and said, oh, look what I've done. And she said, quite all right, quite all right, we'll get it mended. And so that was a relief and I went back again about six weeks later to practice. And underneath the pedals was a sheepskin rug and these two little pedals were sitting there and I looked at them and I thought, what, there they are, isn't that fine, it's all mended. And I started practicing it. Perhaps it was the same piece. I don't know. Um, and to my horror, the pedal came off again in my hand. Well, I decided I couldn't return to that house. The other hazard for a pianist is if the pedal develops a squeak. And this happened to me in a, in a house in Devon. I remember doing a Chopin recital uh, with a, say, and, and the pedal is essential in Chopin. In fact, Chopin said the pedal is the soul, S-O-U-L, of the piano. So it, you can't get more deeply in your thinking than that. And this pedal has started in the second half of this recital, of the recital to go squeak. And it wasn't a very big room, so we couldn't pretend it wasn't there. So I, I found I had to develop a very intense finger legato and stop pedalling altogether. Now that works okay for the right hand, but the left hand is not what I think Chopin wanted. So I put the pedal on, which I couldn't do in that recital. Which makes all the difference, of course. Then, of course, we're not standing at the instrument. The stool is pretty important. <laughs> Again, I remember in, in a house, another house in Devon where I was giving a recital, the actual piano stool was not like this. It was the bottom end of an elephant's foot, poor elephant. Uh, I can see those great big toenails at the bottom. And it was just about to there, so it really was the lowest part. And I sat on this elephant's leg or foot and felt rather sad about it and did the recital just like that. Nobody else seemed to comment. It seemed quite natural to the audience that I would be sitting on an elephant's foot. Which reminds me, I taught um, for a year or two at a little prep school in Devon. Very happy one. And to my horror, I discovered that at a certain week in the year, the whole school uh, went off to paint and zoo. To my horror only because I still had to teach music in paint and zoo well, on a Tuesday and a Thursday on this one week. So I racked my brains and I made sure we had all the instruments with us. Uh, so we started off at, funny enough, the Elephant House and we were playing our recorders. Well, I can't play the recorder, but I made sure the children were playing their recorders and there was the odd little drum beat. 
And one of the elephants, this quite a smiley elephant, came to the came towards us as we did our little concert, just for it, of course. Um, and it, it it appeared to wave its trunk in time to the music, which was most pleasing, a real reward to us. But that, that elephant had a had a mate, and the other elephant at the same time uh, turned around from us and moved off to the back of its of its uh, enclosure and was sick over the back wall. So I, I thought I learned a lesson: you can't please everybody all the time. Which reminds me, Peter Caton, my teacher, he was on a stool such as my great aunt had. Perhaps you remember them, a round stool, which to get higher and higher, you revolved. And this teacher, he was playing sort of down here. And then he moved up here. And he moved with such vigor. This is a Chopin scherzo. He moved with such vigor up to the up to the top end of the keyboard, he found he was actually, he'd overshot and he was facing the audience. And he had a great sense of humor, so it, and the audience loved it and uh, he carried it off well. One more stool story, well, perhaps one more. Um, in Siena, I loved playing in Guido Agosti's master classes in a beautiful art gallery in the Accademia Chigiana, Palazzo Chigi Saracini. And there, there were two pianos side by side. Uh, the maestro was on one and I was at the other and we we had our stools, of course, and I well remember adjusting my stool to get just the right height for the piano. And he happened to be adjusting his stool to do the same as we began the, the lesson. Um, and he looked at me, he turned and said, I was going up and he was going down. He just said, funicular. And one final story on piano stools. It was the Summer School of Dartington International School of Music. Wonderful occasion. And I was playing with a violinist from Glasgow. We were going to play the Debussy Violin Sonata. And we went into the Great Hall. 200 people sitting, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And we had to negotiate various instruments and bits of furniture. There was an organ. There were great wires around the platform. We went down the steps. We came back. We stood up. And he stood there and bowed, and we bowed together. And then I sat down, as usual, at the keyboard. And as I went down, I just sensed that there wasn't a stool at the piano. No one ever thought to put a stool at the piano. It had originally been at the organ for an earlier occasion. And as I sat down, I managed, just before I went and hit the ground, I mean, obviously before that, um, to get myself back up again. But what astonished me was that nobody, not one of the 200 people, someone might have been looking at me, um, said, stop. But this is the great thing of the Alexander technique. If you're thinking upwards, then you're less likely to go down, if, even if you get fairly close to a sitting position. So let's end this little section with a wonderful piece of list, the beginning of his consolation.
next time I'll tell you how I played this in this birthplace. <laughs>